Congratulations, everybody. This is our last stop on Gen Chem Boot Camp. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so pushing all those bad dance moves aside, this actually is our last video in Gen Chem Boot Camp. And what we're going to do is just go over a little review of thermodynamics, and then we are full speed ahead into alkanes and honestly, exciting organic chemistry overall. Okay, so I want to talk about enthalpy, entropy, energy diagrams, and Le Chatelier's principle. I'm sure you guys have at least been introduced to some of these stuff, some of this stuff, but I want to make sure we go over it again. We're all on the same page because it pops up every once in a while, and I want to make sure we're all, um, you know, clear on it. So let's talk about the difference between exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions. So this is kind of underneath the umbrella of enthalpy, right? And we know the symbol for enthalpy, enthalpy is an H, right? I'm sure we've seen this before. We're very used to seeing delta H of a reaction, the enthalpy of a reaction. So let me give you an example of uh, a reaction, and then we'll talk about uh, the enthalpy of that reaction. So I'm going to draw for you guys the chemical equation for the combustion of methane. It looks a little something like this. And quickly, I did this beforehand, but if we put a 2 there and a 2 here, the reaction is balanced. Okay, so combustion is a spontaneous reaction, and as a result, if I'm going to, I looked this value up earlier, but the delta H, or the enthalpy for this reaction, is roughly a negative 242 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so some things to talk about. Since the reaction is, has a negative enthalpy, we know it's exothermic, right? Because that means heat is given off to the environment, so like the, the reaction system is losing energy. So if you want to think about it, this negative 242 kilojoules per mole, that is over here. It's produced as heat. It's a product. Okay? Another thing is that exothermic reactions, they're favorable. They give off heat. That means the overall system's energy is lowered. And like we talked about with acid-base stuff, we're always looking, nature's always looking to become more stable, right? Lower energy. So exothermic reactions are good because the overall energy of a system is lower. On the other hand, if we were endothermic, this reaction value would be positive and the system actually gains energy. So endothermic reactions kind of raise the energy of a system while exothermic reactions lower that energy. Okay? So I don't have an example of endothermic reactions. There's not a lot of examples of them. But I wanna, what I want to do for you guys is actually draw kind of a rough energy diagram sketch of this combustion reaction. So let's grab a nice pretty color. Let's move over here. So if I were to draw for you guys an x, y axis, let's put uh, energy over here on the y axis. And let's put, I'm just going to call it reaction progress. This would just be like, you know, as the reaction goes from reactants to products, what happens? So I'm going to pick an arbitrary spot, just right here. This is where our reactants start off in, in terms of energy. So I'm going to reactants. Reactants. Okay. So we know that since heat is given off in this exothermic reaction, and we discussed how that lowers the energy of a system, the products are going to be at a lower energy state, right? So I'll write products. Products. Okay. So now we kind of have to just draw our the line connecting these two levels together, and we're done. Remember how every reaction, whether it's endo or exothermic, has an activation energy, right? There's always this little hump you have to get over to have a reaction go to completion. And it's always, it always involves energy, right? So it's always a hump, and then whether you go up or down, that depends on whether you're exo or endothermic. So this is kind of how that looks, right? So to highlight some pieces where we can identify values, from uh, delta H's or enthalpies are always defined as where you're starting versus where you're ending, right? So if I'm going to extend this line over here, extend this line over here, this distance right here, this would be your delta H, right? Doesn't matter about the activation energy. It only matters from where you start versus where you end. Okay. However, if we wanted to identify activation energy, you always go from where you start, right here, to where the peak of your graph is, right? The peak of your energy diagram. 
or to where that hump is, right? So just to give you an idea, this right here, this whole distance right there, that would be your E sub A, your activation energy, right? I don't have the values here, but you can see that if you wanted to find it, you'd have to have some number from up here, the starting energy of your reactants, and if you subtracted those two, that would give you your activation energy, right? Okay, not too terribly difficult, right? I'm assuming this is familiar to you guys. Okay, so let's quickly talk about entropy really quickly. Not too much to talk about there. And then we'll get on to Le Chatelet's principle, and we will close the book on our little excursion through Gen Chem until we start doing OCHEM. Okay, so let me draw a simple reaction for you guys. H2 plus O2 goes to water. We need to balance this really quickly. I'm going to stick a 2 over here, and then I'm also going to stick a 2 over here. Okay? So this is these are all gaseous species right here, right? So we know that en enthalpy, you know, negative means uh, exothermic. That's a favorable thing, lowers the energy of a system. Positive enthalpy means we're can, the system's gaining energy that's not necessarily great for stability. So what about entropy? What's going on with entropy? Okay, so some conventions. En our entropy has a symbol, it's, it's S, right? So if we have positive entropy values, that's a good thing. Entropy is a, uh, a measure of disorder. And for all intents and purposes, we just want more disorder. The, the universe is always going to uh, more disorder, it's a, it's a good thing, just trust me on that. So we want positive entry values, that is, that is a good thing, right? So the way you kind of evaluate that qualitatively, kind of, for a reaction, is you look at the moles of gas you have for the reactants, and then the moles of gas you have for the products, right? Gas, because that's, or just moles of anything, really. Okay, so you can see here we have three, and then you can see here we have two. Clearly, we're moving from uh, more moles of stuff to less moles of stuff, and that means we're moving from more disorder to less disorder. So we're getting more ordered from the reaction going to completion. If you see this, this would be kind of like you'd see a negative entropy, right? So we have less disorder, so the entropy effect is not great. However, if you saw uh, less moles of stuff going to more moles of stuff, you'd see a positive entropy. So ideally, as far as like the best possible reaction outcome, we want negative enthalpy, positive entropy. So we want heat given off and more disorder. Okay, so now that we've rehashed enthalpy, entropy, kind of the conventions alongside of those as far as minuses and pluses are concerned, I just want to quickly talk about the Chatelet's principle and then we're all finished up here. Okay. So, one, kind of a scary word to pronounce, but Le Chatelier, right? Basically, what Le Chatelier's principle says is that a system at equilibrium will, it likes to stay that way. It likes to stay equilibrium. So, if something was to push it away from that equilibrium and dis, uh, disrupt that equilibrium, it's going to act in a way to counteract that change, to kind of stay at equilibrium. So, quick verbal example. If a system's at equilibrium, and I introduce more heat and make it hot, it's going to try and do something to make it cold, right? So we're always trying to stay at a baseline. Okay, so here's a quick example. So we talked about this reaction just a few minutes ago, right? The combustion of methane. So we said that it's exothermic, right? And we said, as a result, heat is a product. So I'll draw that over here real quick. So here's where Le Chatelier's principle could come into play. Let's just say... I added in heat. Let's just say, you know, the reaction, we were running this at room temperature, like 25 degrees Celsius. Let's just say I cranked up the heat, and now we're running this reaction at 100 degrees Celsius, right? So it's getting, getting, a little, getting a little hot in here. What would happen to this equilibrium? So here's what you would do. We're adding in heat, right? So you have to identify which side heat, that, that, that's the equilibrium disruption. So we now need to find out where that is in our equation, right? And it's right here. It's on the product side. So since we're adding in more heat, this system wants to stay the same. So since we're adding in more heat, we, it's going to kind of shift in a way that's going, uh, that the reaction itself will produce less heat. So with the introduction of heat, 
this reaction is going to shift to the left. It's going to shift to the side that doesn't have heat because we're adding it in, so the system doesn't want to produce anymore. It wants to produce less. So someone might ask you the question, oh, you know, once this temperature goes from 25 to 100 degrees Celsius, which side of the equilibrium will uh, the system shift towards? And you would say this one. Because, you know, we saw heat's on the product side, we're adding in extra heat, so we're going to shift away from where heat is. See how that works? Okay, let me do one more quick example, because I got plenty of examples for you guys on the thermodynamic worksheet, and I know you're going to crush it over there. Okay, so let's talk about the other reaction we discussed when we were talking about entropy. H2 plus O2 goes to H2O. We need to add a 2 there. We need to add a, whoops, make some room over here. Add a 2 over there. Okay. So, let's talk. So, we talked about temperature. Let's talk about pressure. That's another way we can disrupt the equilibrium, right? We're just talking about different variables we can change. Okay. So, let's say I, the disruption I introduce is let's increase the pressure for this equilibrium, right? So, let's say, I don't know how too familiar you guys are with, uh, actually, let's just say we're running this reaction 14.7 PSI. This is atmospheric pressure. Let's just say we doubled that. Let's just say we're somewhere almost around 30 PSI, right? So we're increasing the pressure. We're cranking it up. Here's how you go about this. Like I said earlier, these are all gases, right? These are all gaseous species. If we're increasing the pressure, the way to think about this is that we kind of want to have less gas because with an increase in pressure, the more gas we have, the more uncomfortable the system's going to be. So if we increase the pressure, we're going to look to kind of shift to the side with less moles of gas, right? So like we did it earlier, we see that there's three moles of gas over here. We see that there's two moles of gas over here. Since we're increasing the pressure, the equilibrium is going to shift to the side with less moles of gas to counteract the change, right? As the Chatelier's principle says, trying to maintain a baseline level for this, the system. So if someone asked you where is the equilibrium going to shift, you would say the equilibrium is going to shift over here because that's the side of the equation with less moles of gas. So we're going to shift towards the product. The reaction is going to drive forward, and that's the way this equilibrium disruption will affect the system. All right, guys, go ahead and uh, knock this worksheet out. And then, once you're done, let's talk about some alkanes and move on to OCHEM 1.